Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming out to One Million Cups again. And as always, thank you to the Kauffman Foundation for hosting us here. Um, we have a couple of great presenters for you today, but in addition, we have a very important announcement. As you all know very well, the Twitter wall is a huge, um, huge thing for One Million Cups. Um, but we actually are changing our Twitter identity because as One Million Cups has grown to uh, cover now 13 cities across the country, we need to have um, a more central voice uh, for the program. And so we're going to be starting to tweet about Kansas City specifically at, at One Million Cups KC, which is now up on the board. Um, so you can follow our live stream there. Um, and, uh, you know, I know a lot of you have been here from the beginning, but how many new faces do we have in the room today? Wow, still a lot, awesome. Thanks guys. Um, so for those of you who don't already know, One Million Cups is a weekly experiential educational program here at the Kauffman Foundation, uh, where we take two presenters who run startups here in Kansas City um, and ask them how we can help them do their jobs better. Um, so, Without further ado, our first presenter, Beth McEwen, um, is the proprietor of the Lawrence Kids Calendar. So, Good morning. I am so excited to be here. Beth McEwen, the owner and publisher of the Kids Calendar. And I'm excited to share both what I've built here in Lawrence. Let's see if I can go back to the beginning. Uh, so what I want to do is share both what I've built here in Lawrence and my plans for growing the business in the future. So the Kids Calendar started in May 2011 from a very real need that I had uh, for my own business. I'm also a private teacher working with kids with learning difficulties. And after about nine months of trying to grow my private practice, I was super frustrated at how hard it was to reach parents in my community directly. And I looked at traditional media and even things like the newspaper and radio had far too broad of an audience to really be able to communicate the message that I wanted to share. And so I wanted to build something that allowed me to reach those parents directly and have an accessible way to share information about my services. So the kids calendar started with a very basic just events calendar and what I was looking to do was build a way for me personally to share information about my open house events or my coffee talks and I wanted to have a place where I could you know post an ad for my business so it came from a very selfish need to solve a problem with my business but I wanted it to also be a place where organizations that were tiny like mine or much more established like the library would have an, an easy way to reach the exact audience they were trying to connect with and that's local parents. So it started with just an events calendar of all the things that were happening for kids and families. And over the past two years, based on feedback from uh, both my readers and organizations, it's, I, I've developed some other sections to the website as well. So there's now a classes and camps section, a community bulletin board for user submitted announcements and other news, and a directory, which I'm really excited about. It's only a month old. And this is a place for parents to find things that are hard to search for online. So if a mom is looking for a place to take her one-year-old on a rainy day, Google probably will not know what to do in Lawrence. Uh, but she's going to find some ideas in this directory. So these four sections of the website are the online component of the kids' calendar now. Uh, but I didn't want a local business like this to just exist online. And so the kids' calendar is actually, um, I actually host several live events during the year, too. And one of those is the Kids Summer Fun Fair every April. And this is an opportunity to bring the fun from the calendar into real life. So I have local organizations sharing information about their summer programs. And this is a chance for them to connect with my readers face to face and learn more about what they're looking for, sort of part carnival, part info fair. Starting this October, I'll also be hosting a day of play as part of the Canes Arcade Global Cardboard Challenge. And I could talk about that for just 26 minutes, so I'll, I'll leave that up there. But it's basically an opportunity to um, get the kids interested in being creative and imaginative and build cool things with cardboard. 
And then I also tag along to other community events. So each month you might find me at the farmer's market, at a library event, at the 4th of July parade, or, or celebration in the park, that sort of thing. And I give out balloons on sticks, because that brings the families over. The kids can't resist getting a balloon. And this gives me that chance to talk to the families directly, share information from the calendar, and, um, and also share information from the organi other organizations I, pr I partner with. So, the online components and the, all of the live events are the kids' calendar. And I feel like at this point, it's reached a stage in its development where I'm pretty confident that what I've built matches both what my readers are looking for and what the organizations that I work with need for their business. So it's time to grow in a new way. And so my plan is to develop a license program that makes it easy to take the kids' calendar platform and really replicate it easily in, in new cities. And so I've got a, a couple of ideas for how I could do that. One option is to uh, reach out to the publishers of, sim of sites similar to mine. Uh, there are people all over the country trying to solve this problem. And sometimes it's just a Google Calendar embedded on a web page, and there's not a whole lot of technology behind it. And so this would be a way for them to really upgrade what they're doing. And you know, they're, they've already shown an interest in this kind of work and could just um, be providing a, a bigger resource for their community. Another option I'm looking at is to reach out to the publishers of kids' magazines. I found in my research that many of them don't have websites at all and could benefit from adding this to their business. And then the third would be to just start from scratch with a tech-savvy mompreneur in new cities and really you know, build it out from there with you know, giving them some flexible options. So thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to hearing feedback and ideas on sort of how to evaluate all of these different options. Thank you. Any questions? I do have one question real quick while we sure. get to kick it off. Um, so this is a pretty robust platform. How did you go about actually getting it built? Because I, I built it all myself. <laughs> Uh, very slowly, because I had to teach myself how to code, and, and it's, it's, right now it's all based in WordPress, so there's some really smart plugin people out there that have created um, plugins that I was able to customize for this. Um, but yeah, sort of learning on the fly. It took me about a year to get the classes and camps section up, because I needed to figure out how to make it the way I wanted it to be, to have the function functionality I wanted. Beth, question for you right here. Thank you, Beth. Bob King with Prodigy Arcade. Last week, we heard about Local Start and the initiative for focusing on made in Kansas City and, and local businesses. I would suggest uh, to, to think about using local bookstores mm -hmm. in communities because they often have children's reading programs Absolutely. and it would revitalize them because they're trying to compete in this Amazon market. So Absolutely. I would encourage you to think about that. That's a great idea. Thanks. Next question to your left. Yeah. So we have a mom-to-mom -mom blog in Kansas City. Are you familiar with that? I'm familiar with there. There are several different options in the Kansas City area. I, I would just think that they would be a wealth of information and, and advice for you on okay. um, crafting this in Kansas City and, and kind of customizing it. Each city is just a little bit different. It's true. So <laughs> tapping into those moms who are really active um, on the blog, would I think, would probably be beneficial. Great. Thanks. Question here at the back. If you're going to take this around the country, I can imagine that one of the first questions you're going to ask, be asked is, what's the revenue potential? So how much money is Lawrence Kids Calendar making now? That's a, that's a great question. So, you know, obviously there are ads on the website that I have um, taken out of this presentation just because I wanted to show the functionality of the site. There are ads, but I try to keep it as tasteful as possible. So there's, you know, it's not just overrun with that. Um, but my, my plan is for the, the kids' calendar to be able to, pr to reproduce you know, an income anywhere between 30 and 40,000. And only about 10% of that is based on advertising. So the rest of it, like the, the events calendar is totally free to post to, and I did that on purpose. I didn't want the events calendar to be missing events because somebody did not have the budget to post something. But the other sections, the classes and camps, community board, and the directory, and of course all of the live events, are premium postings for the organizations that would like 
to be able to use that as a marketing tool. So most of the income is coming from that and from partnerships with local organizations. A question back here by the doors. Yes. I have like five daughters and they always need something to do to stay out of my <laughs> hair, especially on sports Saturdays. Mm -hmm. Is there a mobile app so that I can pull it up on the phone and say, here, let's go here? <laughs> There's not currently a mobile app. I've designed the website to be as mobile friendly as possible using the existing infrastructure. Um, and I also send out an email every Sunday night that just is a digest of what's coming up in the next week. And I've found that my readers primarily use that. So they refer to it almost every day as a guide of like, this is what's happening at two o'clock. Let's go, let's go participate in that event. So between that weekly email and the way the website itself is designed, I'm, I'm meeting that, that mobile need for now. Question over here? Yes. How saturated is your market? Do you know? Because like uh, for us already, we the, the Language Project advertises in iFamilyKC, as well as a couple other type, Mamapanur type websites as well. So sure. uh, in your research, how saturated is your market? So I, I'm focusing on communities that are more the size of Lawrence than Kansas City. So, you know, in that 100,000 or less category. And obviously big cities like Kansas City, Chicago, they're going to already have a solution that is as robust as this or possibly even more complex um, just because of the size of the community. But reaching out to communities that are similar to Lawrence, I think there's still a lot of opportunity for um, giving them an option that they haven't had before. Question for you back here in the hallway. You had mentioned that uh, posting to the calendar is free. Um, so I would imagine that a kid's calendar, you would want to uh, make sure that it's safe and that would be a priority. How do you make sure that those events are screened to make sure that they're legitimate events uh, and they're safe for kids to be a part of? Sure. Uh, so I would say at this point, more than 80% of the content on the website is user submitted. So I am in direct contact with the organizations. There are forms online that they complete. So it's, you know, they're, they're providing the content to me. But again, with a smaller community like Lawrence, it's a lot easier to get a handle on those sorts of things. It's, it's pretty rare for somebody to pop up on my radar and post something and I don't at least have some idea of who they are and what they're, what they're offering. So I think that, that may be one of the benefits of the smaller market. <laughs> so I have a question. Uh, <clears throat> as you launch these uh, new cities, how are you looking to do it from an infrastructure perspective? I mean, the, the mm -hmm. websites are pretty easy to duplicate, but I assume Lawrence is successful because you're in Lawrence and you know Lawrence and you're connected to the community. And so what does that look like as you start to recruit and probably have to either volunteer or pay those people, you know, to talk about that story or how you see that happening. Sure, so that's definitely one of the challenges that I'm trying to figure out how to proceed. Um, but I think the best value in this site in another city is that somebody that's local and cares about that community and is connected to the organizations is managing it. So I really wanna, that's why I'm leaning more towards a license program so that somebody can really take ownership of that site. And my, my role at that point is to support them and help them grow as a business owner and you know, give them the tools that they need so it doesn't take them two years to get off the ground, that they can ramp up a lot faster. All right, do we have more volunteer questions or are we gonna have to start a draft? <laughs> Good morning. How do you drive traffic to your website to get more page views and more subscribers? Mm -hmm. in the and more money. <laughs> in the beginning, it was really just word of mouth. So, you know, parents talking to other parents. And it's sort of an interesting thing that when you create something that parents are referring to every day, they do talk to their friends about it and, and share it. So it's really been, um, Primarily that, and I do, I've do. i seen big bumps in my readership at each of the live events I've hosted, and that's why I've really tried to incorporate more of that in the past year, uh, because you know people like to, to talk to people face to face, and then you know I find that after that, they're willing to go and interact online, because they have a sense for sort of what it's about. 
Um, and you notice I don't have a Twitter handle, and that's because, at least in Lawrence, moms are on Facebook. And so the Facebook page, has, my Facebook page and my weekly email are the two sort of social media pieces that have been most effective for me. Question for you here to your right. Yes. So do you have after school programs and childcare classes in, mm -hmm. in your classes section? Uh, I, I, if I were to put something like childcare on the website, it would go in the directory rather than in one of the other sections. Um, and at this point, there are a few sort of like early release day programs listed on the calendar or in the classes in camp section, sort of depending on the format of the program. But you know, some of those can get really overwhelming, and so I try to not have content that just is like every day. It's the same, the same thing. Well, if we know it's going to happen every day, let's put it somewhere where somebody that wouldn't expect it could find it. And usually, the directory is the better option for that. Yeah. Question up here: What is your average weekly time commitment? Mm -hmm. uh, so. That's a, there's a couple of ways I could respond to that. One, for actually managing the site. So making sure the content gets published, the weekly email goes out, posting to Facebook, that sort of thing. It's somewhere between four to six hours a week. So a mom getting started really could add this in sort of around the rest of her schedule. Um, for me, trying to build it out in, in, in a much bigger way and, and scale it up, um, right now, it's, it's you know, at, at least a part-time job, if not more, <laughs> in addition to the teaching that I do. But I, I feel like that's sort of the, the piece of growing it to the size I'd like it to be. Question for you back here. Yeah. Has there been any interest from daycare providers uh, to the point where perhaps there could be a reduced rate offered for events if they bring a lot of children? Hmm. Uh, I'm not sure I totally understand your question. Would you mind clarifying it? Sorry. Yeah, the, the thought is is that a lot of daycare providers are looking for cultural events and activities for their children that they provide care for. And I was wondering if perhaps they some of the offerings then would reduce the, uh, let's say, admission fee for larger groups. Uh, so I don't control the prices on anything. So if the daycare provider wanted to connect with one of the organizations posting an event, they absolutely could. Um, but I think one of the benefits of my website over some of the competitors that I've seen is that the events calendar is really for everything. So if somebody wanted to charge $500 for an event, they totally could. I'm not going to stop them from putting it on the site. Um, and, and I think in, in other places, the events calendar will only list free events. And that's not as valuable to an organization that's looking to you know, generate revenue from their activities as well. Next question to your left. Yeah. Hi, I have a couple questions. One is, can you search by age group if you're looking for something? Um, and another thing is, I, I, you said that you don't want to go into the Kansas City market, and I wonder why, because I, I babysit nieces and nephews, and whenever I have them for the weekend, I'm always trying to look for what activities, and I have a very difficult time trying to find things in the Kansas City area that are age appropriate for them. And so I'm wondering, am I just missing the wrong websites in Kansas City, or why do you not want to go into the Kansas City area? Uh, I do think there are some websites that are similar to what I do here in, in the Kansas City area. I don't know if you would find what you were looking for there because we do have a, a slightly different model. Um, but that would be something that if somebody has some experience and would like to, to share their expertise with me, I, I, my idea was that I would sort of target markets where there was not a competing platform in the beginning at least until I really sort of establish the, the brand and then possibly have conversations with people that wanted to bring something and actually compete with an existing website. So, <laughs> I had one more question is, do you have a way of, um, if people go to some of the different events and things that, that are being offered on your um, site, for the families or the parents to offer um, feedback? And then that mm -hmm. could either bring more interest or it would, it, I mean, it could help in a couple ways. It could help the organizers plan a better, mm -hmm. better event or it could get more people there for future events. So is there a feedback um, page or, or area on your site? Uh, there is a, sort of like a suggestion page for parents, but uh, that would be an interesting thing to sort of build into the event description pages so that parents could kind of go back and, and share their experience. Question for you right here. Yeah. Have you considered 
encouraging the people who are listing on your site to offer specific discounts to your members so that not only do they know how effective their listing are, but your members have more reason to come to your site? Sure. Uh, I have considered things like discounts and contests and giveaways. This is a, a pretty common thing in the, uh, the, the businesses that target moms in particular. Um, and I've stayed away from it because I want to be able to build this business on the value I'm providing the organizations for them to be able to be successful. And if they want to offer a discount or do a giveaway, there's a place. Like they can post their, their contest on the community board, but it's not a tool that I use to grow my business because I don't want them, sh I, I would rather they, they pay the premium listing to be on the site and then see if they can grow their, their business that way rather than taking a cut out of, out of the sales that they would make. And so far that's working. You know, I've not needed to do giveaways in order to get the response that I do. So I have a question over here. Um, <clears throat> what, what is one of the biggest, I guess, if you could pick out one of the biggest challenges or the biggest hurdle that you see right now to, that's keeping this from going and kind of exploding and getting bigger. I mean, this it looks like you've brought together the right tools to create an incredible platform. You've got a good brand, and I know that's where you're looking to license the brand and take that and kind of take the tool set you've put together um, using the technology. What's the biggest thing that's keeping you from getting to that next step so it's no longer four to six hours, <laughs> but it's a full-time growing business right. that you can, you can grow with? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I feel like I'm sort of out of my comfort zone in wanting to grow it. So like, I know that's the step I want to take next, but I don't have any experience scaling up into new cities and sort of evaluating which of those options you know, that I've, I've identified might be the best way to go. And honestly, like I could probably do all three at the same time. The first and the second could be a white label option for businesses that want to keep their own brand and then continue growing the kids' calendar at the same time. But honestly, like I could do that and I still wouldn't necessarily know how to evaluate which of those was successful. So um, I'm at a place where I kind of need some help. <laughs> Next question in the middle. It seems like your target market is parents. Do you ever target the kids themselves? I mean, young kids go online all the time and they're like, hey, I want to do all these little events. Uh, no, actually, and, and that's a, a good thing to notice. Uh, I've purposely tried to make my, my platform pretty and, and inviting to go to, but it is not a kid site. And that's because parents are the ones that make those decisions or you know, drive their kids to the activities or whatever. So you know, it's, it's not necessarily for the kids at all, it's for the parents. Okay, well I think unless there's any other questions, we're gonna wrap up with the, the normal last question yes. um, of you've got a room full of entrepreneurs and people that really care about supporting and pushing you forward. Sounds like you do need some, uh, some, maybe some education or some help getting to the next step, but what can we as a oh, community as a whole do for you? Yeah, I, thank you. I am really looking to um, move forward in the next six months with scaling into new communities, and I would love to connect with anyone that has experience scaling a business into new cities in, you know, whether it worked out the way you wanted it to or not, I can learn, you know, some, some great things from what you guys have experienced as well. So I'd love to connect afterwards. Great job. Thank you. Okay, so I see some people standing in the back. Why don't you guys, John, Bill, come on up, come grab a seat. I just pointed them out. Come on up, grab some seat. There's a bunch of seats up here in the front, which is where everybody wants to sit, at the front. A um, few announcements real quick here. Um, one, just a, a reiteration, if you weren't here earlier, we are switching up our local uh, Twitter handle um, because we're taking, now that we're in 13 cities, um, and even going to be in probably close to 20 or more cities by the end of the year. Uh, One Million Cups, at One Million Cups, is really going to be the global brand on our, our Twitter, sphere, Twitter sphere. And uh, so make sure that if you're tweeting about something here in Kansas City, you do it at, the, at One Million Cups KC. So that'll be more specific, and each community can have their own handle. Um, what else have we got? Keith Mays has a quick announcement.
Yeah, you should have seen one of these in your seat. Uh, I just want to tell you a little bit more about it. Um, this is a workshop next week after One Million Cups at 1030, and it is just for you. Um, I don't know if you've noticed in uh, search results recently, there are certain results that are popping up with people's faces, and it says, buy so-and-so. Um, and Google is giving these people authority. They're basically making them thought leaders, you know, when you search on tips for building an app or, or whatever, people will pop up. And it's not because they're necessarily the, you know, the biggest experts. It's because they figured out the system and what you need to do to become a thought leader online. The benefit to that, if you're doing a startup, is it's sort of a backdoor way of bringing attention to your business, becoming a thought leader in the, you know, if you were building an app, you know, offering tips. Um, so you're promoting your business at the same time as your thought leadership. So Mark Traphagen, guy we've been working with for quite a while, is going to do this quick workshop, give you an idea of what this new um, sort of strategy is. And it really is open now. It's not being exploited. Um, as much as it could be. So it's an opportunity for you to um, kind of build your personal brand and to build your business's um, visibility online. So that's what this is about. Please go register um, and look forward to seeing you there. Thank you. So a couple of quick logistics things. If you guys are interested, I know a lot of people come up to us afterwards saying, you know, how do I present? If you are interested in presenting, uh, very easy, go to One Million Cups. Everybody that presents has to go through this process. Go to OneMillionCups.com, uh, then click on Kansas City, and then there's a register to present button. It's right in the middle of the page. Um, so fill out that form that gets us all your information, and we'll do our best to get back to you quickly, though um, we also, the, the community leaders here run businesses as well, so we do find that uh, we're trying to get faster at getting back to everybody. Um, so, next up, I, this is, and unfortunately it took us, again, this is one that took us a little bit, a little bit of time to get back to him, I feel bad for that, but the, we, we had a chance um, to be a part of one of the, the small business, um, my company had a chance to be a part of one of the small business uh, events here in town, and Ben came up and he said, hey man, I, I, I really am excited to present it at One Million Cups, you've got to see my product, take this home. Uh, Ask your wife, that was the biggest thing, ask your wife if she would use this. And no joke, since then, uh, my wife has like carries these things in her purse, which says something, so, because uh, that's precious space, right? Um, so I wanna bring up Ben with Mighty Handle, and uh, this is one of the most exciting products, and it sounds like he's exploding right now, so let's give him a warm welcome. Hi guys, my name is Ben Rendo. My company is Mighty Green Solutions, and the first product we are bringing to market is the Mighty Handle. For anybody who has ever lived in an apartment and struggled to get the groceries up the stairs, uh, try to carry your groceries from the condo uh, all the way up to your fifth floor, or even simply for moms out there who have a baby on one hip or trying to crowd two more kids inside and they just want to get the groceries in, I think Mighty Handle will provide a real benefit for you. I came up with the idea for Mighty Handle about eight years ago. I had been transferred from St. Louis back to Kansas City where I'm from, and for about five months we were building a house in the Northland. Uh, my wife stayed back in St. Louis, and I lived in this dumpy walk-up apartment uh, downtown off Broadway. I would go grocery shopping every week and then get home. I would load everything up on my forearms and crab claw everything, try to scoot across Broadway, and then go up seven flights of stairs. And by the time I got to my front door, my hands, fingers, and forearms would just be burning in red from those little bag loops cutting into my skin. And so I thought there had to be a better way, and that's why I came up with the idea for Mighty Handle. Simply uh, put, Mighty Handle provides the uh, easiest, safest, and most effective way to carry and transport your groceries. Uh, instead of right now where you see people who have the bags staggered up and down their forearms or tightly clutching everything, with Mighty Handle, you just simply 
hang the bags off of our uh, hooks on the patent pending design. It has an ergonomic soft grip, and by doing so, it'll take the stress and strain off your hands, fingers, and forearms and transfer the weight of those groceries up onto your shoulders where we have much more muscle mass. It also works great for dry cleaning, painting, and all number of household goods. For anybody who's ever come out of the dry cleaners with your fingers like this when you have all the hangers hanging off, you know how it is when they're cutting in. And so with Mighty Handle, you just go up to the checkout, they hang the hooks on here, you flip it over your shoulder, you carry outside, and then put it on the little luggage clip in your car. And so you can get from A to B very, very simply. Uh, also for anybody who are home improvement enthusiasts, trying to carry around multiple cans of paint, especially when you're going upstairs, really, really digs into your hands. So with Mighty Handle, it provides a much more easy uh, and comfortable way to do so. How it works. Uh, with Mighty Handle, one of our main benefits is our twist lock feature. Uh, for anybody who's ever driven home from high B, you know, Price Chopper Hen House, and found your groceries spilled all throughout the back of your trunk, uh, I think this will resonate with you. With Mighty Handle, you have your bags hanging on, about seven to eight bags. Each Mighty Handle will actually carry up to 50 pounds of groceries. We've, we've tested them that far. You'll set it down in your trunk, turn clockwise twice, and then set it down. And by doing so, it'll really lock up those plastic bag loops as well as the reusable bags and keep your groceries from spilling throughout your trunk. Uh, the way that I kind of thought this would be a good feature is I can't tell you how many times I would come home, uh, open the trunk to my Jeep, and would find an errant jar of pasta sauce or salsa that would roll out and then just shatter in my garage. And so I thought there would be a better way to keep everything just locked up in one place, that there'd be some real value there. Before we launched Mighty Handle, we wanted to make sure that there was a real consumer demand and need for this product. We went out and hired Ipsos, which is one of the largest consumer analytic companies in the US, and said, we want to see if there's actually a demand for this product before we go full bore. Uh, Ipsos went out uh, and showed nearly 4,000 consumers across the US cutting across multiple age, sex, income, and geographic demographics. They watched a 60-second video and then were asked a series of questions. When the results came in, we were incredibly pleased to find out that over two-thirds of participants saw Mighty Handle as a product that they would use themselves, they would purchase, and they would recommend to another consumer at our intended price point. So far, uh, our distribution has been pretty strong this summer. We officially launched uh, the second week of July, and in about the last six to seven weeks, uh, we have full di distribution in all the Schnucks markets throughout St. Louis, Illinois, Indiana, and then this month we will be launching across uh, Kansas City in High Bees, Price Choppers, and Hen Houses. Uh, we also sell through our website, www.mightyhandle.com. And then in January, we'll be appearing on QVC to sell a Mighty Handle shopping system, which is two Mighty Handles and four of our Mighty Handle smart bags, which I will talk about a little bit later. As a startup, and I'm sure most of you guys can uh, emphasize with this, our marketing budget has been very, very, very slim. Uh, so we had to figure out what would be the most effective way to get the word out about Mighty Handle. Uh, I was incredibly fortunate uh, to meet a woman named Anita Newton, who was former vice president of marketing at AMC Theaters, and was able to bring her on as a co-founder uh, and head of marketing for our company. In about the last month, Anita has reached out to mommy bloggers across the U.S. We've had over 40 positive reviews. Uh, we were featured uh, just this past Sunday in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch as a product uh, moms need to get for back to school. We'll be in the Huffington Post this month. And then lastly, we'll be featured in the November issue of Good Housekeeping, which has nearly 5 million readers. And again, Mighty Handle will be featured as a product that moms everywhere need to get. This just shows uh, on some of our mommy blogs, they love sending in pictures of themselves and their kids using Mighty Handles. Uh, that has really been uh, probably one of the most rewarding things about this entire experience. Uh, you know, when I came up with the idea for Mighty Handle, I thought this could be a good product, but really didn't know where I'd go from there. Uh, but I've been able to meet some incredible people, as I said, Anita, uh, as well as Tim Webster and Kurt Van Keppel, who are in the audience. 
and this past six months to be able to have them become more like family as opposed to teammates has just been an incredible blessing. And so that's just been something that I cannot stress enough about how great it has been uh, to be an entrepreneur and, and do this startup. With Mighty Handle, uh, our slogan is uh, more bags, one trip, no spills. And it is really as simple as that. Uh, when you use your Mighty Handles, you'll get home from the grocery store to find all of your groceries locked up in place the exact way you got them. You'll be able to comfortably carry them inside and get everything inside in one trip. Again, it provides the safest, easiest, and most effective way to get your groceries from the kitchen aisle, I'm sorry, from the store aisle to your kitchen counter. As far as our product lifestyle, so this is the first product that we are launching, Mighty Handle. Uh, but what I'm really, really excited about is our Mighty Handle shopping system. Um, many municipalities on the West Coast, uh, as well as the entire state of Hawaii, parts of Texas, New Jersey, and increasing other parts of the East Coast have instituted a plastic bag ban. So if you or I were to go into any grocery or retail store in those areas, we either have to bring our own reusable bags or pay 10 cents for every paper bag. And so I thought, what would be a great way to capitalize on this? And so that's where we came up with the idea to create Mighty Handle Smart Bags. We are contracting with the University of Georgia uh, to license a permanently antimicrobial compound. Uh, this compound renders the bags germ-free and kills bacteria, viruses, mold. So if you ever read any news stories about E. coli, salmonella, just all kinds of nasty stuff getting on your groceries, smart bags will prevent them from growing. And the reason we call them smart bags is you can throw them in your trunk, you can throw them in your garage, and you never have to worry about them. They're smart and that they continue to work kill that bacteria and virus and never lose its effectiveness. It's the easiest way to keep your food safe uh, from produce section to the food you put in your family. And uh, what questions can I answer for you? Great job. Open up for questions. So I have a, I'm going to kick one off. There's a question back at the back there. I have a, I have a, I'm going to kick one off with the question I always wonder we, we ask a lot of um, questions around, you know, tell us a little bit more about the product itself. It's so, such a great, simple solution to an un, almost unforeseen problem uh, until you, of course, you remember it when you're walking out of the store. But how did you get it made? I think that's a, that's a big challenge that we all think, oh, I've got this great idea, but tell us the process that it took to actually going out and getting it produced, and now you're, you have a manufacturing. Sure. Uh, when I first came up with the idea, I just sketched it basically on the back of a napkin and, and kind of forgot about it. Uh, throughout the past few years, I've made little tweaks to it until finally, a couple years ago, I had had an idea for a, a software business and had kind of put it on the back burner. Uh, I thought, you know, I'll, I'll get back to this in a couple of years, you know, maybe once things have settled down with my <coughs> career. Uh, and then one day I was reading the business journal and saw that this company had gotten over a million, that a company had came up with the idea for that same software and got a million dollars in funding. And so that made me really realize with Mighty Handle, if I was ever going to do anything with it, I needed to act now uh, before somebody else put it on the market. Uh, so I went to uh, one of my good friends, a gentleman named Rick Kreska, who owns Ink Cycle and Lenexa. They have huge manufacturing capabilities. And Rick was actually kind enough to let me sit down with his engineers, use their equipment, and go through multiple variations until we hammered out a prototype of Mighty Handle. He didn't charge me for the engineer's time. He didn't charge me for the use of the machinery. So for somebody trying to you know, bootstrap from the ground up, that was just incredible. And then once I had that uh, final prototype, I took it to a company called Missions Plastics North, which is where our manufacturing facilities are. We're KC company made in the USA, all the manufacturing is done here. Went through different materials, different colors, different variations until we, we found what uh, we thought would be something the consumer would find value in. Um, next question to your left. So I totally related to your story about living in a high rise and trying to get your groceries <laughs> up, up to your apartment. Um, but I also um, have experienced something that I'm not sure too many people in the room have, which is uh, grocery shopping and riding the bus. And so um, here in Kansas City, it's not um, all that common um, for probably most people in the room. But in the bigger cities, many people take public transportation. 
And so I'm wondering if you've looked at that market and also um, <clears throat> looked at chains that uh, serve uh, low-income communities like um, Aldi uh, or other uh, brands. I'm, I'm not familiar with anyone else but them. I, I think it would be invaluable to moms who are, like you said, trying to juggle kids and grocery bags. And also I've seen stuff come out of bags on the bus when they turn, you know, and, and all that stuff. So I, I just think it would be so um, wonderful to, to offer that to those folks too. You're absolutely right. In St. Louis, when we launched in Schnucks, they have a number of markets that are in lower income areas or uh, customers are taking the bus because uh, they live in almost a food desert where there's not a grocery store within 10 miles. And so we have actually sold a very good amount of Mighty Handles in those areas. Because I mean, if you can emphasize with a mom who is trying to carry a baby, has two more kids, and then they're trying to get the groceries, go across you know 10 blocks to get from the store home. So. You're absolutely right that Mighty Handle will provide a real benefit to those shoppers. Question for you back here in the hallway. I love the concept of your reusable bags, but is it possible you could have, like, for guys that go to the store, uh, like sports logos on them, those bags are really pretty. They're kind of <laughs> cute. I'm glad you said that because I have thought the exact same thing. I mean, my, my wife likes those bags a lot more than I do, but we have thought about that making... Uh, a man version of the mighty handle where uh, <laughs> it'll be all black. I really, really like your idea about licensing out uh, sports logos. I'd love to have a Chiefs mighty handle smart bag, but for the time being, after we roll out those, it probably will just be something maybe a little more, more understated. A question here in the middle. So uh, thank you. So this morning I had a question and I came to him and he said, hey, just try it for yourself. I have, this feels awesome if you get a chance to actually hold it. Um, I probably never would have purchased one had I just seen it on a shelf. But because I actually felt the handle, I love the way it feels and it's way stronger than I thought it would be. Do you have any tactics that you've talked about um, to get these in people's hands? To force people to actually hold them? Because now like, oh yeah, I'm gonna talk to my wife about it. She's gonna buy several, I'm sure. Do you have any plans for that? We do, that, that's a great question. We'll be doing demo days at Hy-Vee, uh, Price Chopper and Hen House, so we can actually show customers the product. Uh, one thing we have found is that once people use them, they say, that feels great, I, I wish I would have thought of that, I'll never go back to using my hands to carry the groceries, but we've gotta actually let them know that something like this is available. So for us doing a demo day where we can actually showcase it right at the front of the grocery store is, is something we're really excited about. Uh, next question to your left. Actually, two comments and a question. First of all, great presentation. You, you really did a great job. Thank you. Uh, two, kudos for being made in the USA and made in Kansas City. That's awesome. I think that's pretty cool. And my question is um, the market. You mentioned what's the competition like? And also, how did you get this off the ground? Did you take investment outside or is this you know, fully self-funded? Sure. Uh, I had Polsonelli do all of our patent work. We have design and utility patents uh, submitted for Mighty Handle. And uh, when they did the product search, uh, I thought, you know, I was the first one who had ever thought about something like this, but I was wrong. There have been multiple patents. Uh, something that makes our design nice, though, is that you can simply get the bags on and off literally within seconds. Uh, some of these other bag carriers, uh, that Polsonelli found when they were doing the patent search. Uh, there's a lot of labor. And then for, if you have older uh, and seniors who suffer from arthritis, I mean, I had a hard enough, because I, I purchased some of these on Amazon once Polsonelli told me about them. I could barely get these little bags off the loop. So for somebody who has issues uh, with their circulation, it's just not gonna work. And then as far as the startup, uh, I, uh, my background's in software sales at automatic data processing. Uh, when decided that we really wanted to do this. I talked to my wife, uh, we downsized our house, uh, I cashed out my 401k, uh, took on uh, a little bit of money from my family and friends, and then uh, the team who I mentioned earlier also have put uh, money in. So uh, today we have not taken any, any private equity or any outside capital. Question for you back here. I love the name, uh, Mighty Handle, and I have an idea that might make you a million 
dollars today. Tell me more. Real simple. Mighty Handle Man. He is your superhero mascot, saving shoppers all over America from breaking their backs and spilling their groceries. And with that superhero mascot, you will get attention and you will be a success. Mighty hero, Mighty Handle Man. Next question up front. Have you considered going to the people at Hy-Vee or the big major supermarket chains and getting their name on it as well? Well, we have looked into that, like stores that uh, we've met with on a national level. So right now we have talks with uh, Target, Walmart, Bed Bath & Beyond, and Walgreens. And for those stores that are going to order very, very large quantities of them, we're more than happy to co offer co-branding. Uh, but for local regional stores right now, it's especially while we're launching, it's very important to us to kind of keep our branding. Very good question. Question here in the middle. Um, hi. Um, it's like a little follow-up question after that gentleman's um, the design of it. I think it's really easy to fit in like a purse, like a lady purse. But for guys, I would like to have it even smaller or foldable that could fit in my pocket or something. Because a lot of times I'm even too lazy to bring like bags around. Like it would be really good if I could just put it in my pocket so that I could just go into a car or shop and then pull it out from my pocket instead of like carrying it all the time. Sure. It, it, it will not fit in your front pocket, but for your back pocket, if you have on jeans, khakis, or slacks, it actually will fit in your back pocket. Uh, that's how I usually take it into the store. Question for you back here. It's actually an extension of that question, but everything's going green and the plastic bags are going away. And I see like the idea of having a magnet or something that could stick on the side of a reusable bag or something like that. Because if you're going to check out, you're putting your groceries in there. Oh wait, my mighty handle things down here in the bottom of all my groceries. And the clerk's not gonna know that, but if it's on the side, just, I don't know about the smart bag. I didn't hear more detail about that. Well, with our, with our smart bag shopping system that will be on QVC, it will be two mighty handles. It will be a very small uh, carrying case. We're still working on if it's going to be foldable or if it's going to be solid. And then four smart bags will fit in the middle. So it's something very simple and compact uh, that a woman can simply carry in their purse. For a guy, you would have to carry it and you know, put it on the top of your uh, uh, grocery cart when you get inside. But uh, yep, they, they will be very, very easy to transport. Next question right here. There's a really great event at Bartle Hall in the late fall called the Holiday Mart. Mm -hmm. You should be there because it is your target market. All Basically all the ladies right in your kind of age range, you really should look into having a booth rental there because I feel like your sales would be insane. You said Holiday, holiday, holiday Mart. Mart. Yep, it's at Bartle Hall and it's usually I think in late October. So I mean I would strongly suggest you looking into a booth space there because not only would that get the word out but I feel like your sales would really go through the roof okay well definitely a lot of ladies you. nodding their head to that so you have a question <laughs> and to add to that too, probably makers fair if you haven't participated in that at Union Station last time you were here you mentioned the get on the shelf competition with Walmart is that still ongoing or is that closed uh, just to uh, kind of follow up on that we had submitted our product to Walmart's Get on the Shelf contest. It's a contest they instituted last year where small businesses, entrepreneurs across the U.S. can submit a very brief uh, video pitch to their, about their product for a chance to get national placement. Walmart headquarters narrows it down, picks out their finalists, and then puts the videos on walmart.com where people can go on and vote. And fortunately, Mighty Handle made it into these voting finals. Uh, the voting finals ended at midnight on Tuesday but they won't let us know uh, until the end of September. So I promise you I will, I will keep you updated. Fingers crossed. Question for you oh, right over here. Uh, yeah, I noticed you did uh, market research before you kind of started your, your business. Um, how important was that into actually developing the product? Is that kind of the protocol you've seen with this type of product in the past? Because, I mean, it seems like for a startup, kind of a, a big expense. It, it definitely was an expense, uh, but for other successful and well-established entrepreneurs I talked to before I started the company, they said it is crucial that you have to go out and find those target segments that you're going to be selling to and, and make sure that there's actually demand for this product. Because I'm, you know, it's 
I mean, it's one thing, you know, for my wife and my mom and friends to tell me, like, that's a good idea, but to be able to find strangers who will say, you know, actually, I will part with my money for that, uh, it's very important because in the event that it was a flop, it's going to save so much more money and time down the road saying, you know what, we need to go back and make changes before we launch. Next question in the back to your left. Okay, I was wondering if Mighty Handle would be effective for like airports where there's a lot of bags. Uh, my wife uh, works in sales for a uh, bridal uh, design company, and so she takes her Mighty Handle and carries them around with her everywhere. So that's a great idea. We we have we haven't looked into it, but we we started kind of early exploring about selling in uh, Sky Mall and the little magazine that's on all the planes, as well as. Uh, different little stores in the airport. Question over here on your right. So have you thought about setting up shop in farmer's markets? Because if you go down to River Market, you see people all over the place walking with six and eight bags in each hand every Saturday. We have not done so yet, but that's a very, really very good should. idea. Question back here next to the wall. So what can we do to help you? Uh, to help us, what you can do uh, is <laughs> go to hy V Hen House, or Price Chopper and buy a Mighty Handle. Uh, as I said, we sell through our website. Our, our e-commerce portals actually run through Amazon. Uh, so if you buy on MightyHandle.com, uh, please leave us a good review. Uh, you can also check us out uh, our Facebook page, uh, as well as our Twitter, which is at Mighty Handle. Uh, and then finally, we are actively looking for distribution partners. So if you know of regional grocery chains or retail stores uh, that might be a good fit uh, for Mighty Handle, uh, I would love to speak with you more. I know we're used to being done after that question, but we still have more questions, so we're going to keep going. OK. Uh, next question in the back here. So I keep looking at you, and I keep thinking, are we going to see you on late night television selling like OxyClean, but now it's going to be <laughs> by Mighty Handle. <laughs> Is this how we're going to, I mean, is that what you're going you're gonna to do that? If, if we had the money right now to do one of those late night in, infomercials, absolutely, man. Those things make a ton of money. Uh, yeah. But uh, right now, we, we do not have the budget to do late night infomercials. Maybe one day. OK, question right here. Hi, this is a great presentation. What are the smart bags made of, and uh, are they disposable? The, the smart bags are made out of a recycled polyester nylon. Uh, so at its very core, it actually is recycled plastic. So if you ever do not want to use your smart bag again, you can put it in the recyclable bin and it will be recycled. Question for you right here. Um, I don't know how much say you have in like product placement in like Hy-Vee and Hen House. But if I saw it like with all the paper plates and stuff, I would be like, oh, that's a great idea. But if I saw it when I saw my bags, I would get it. So if it was like you know, next, next, next to the gum in the checkout lane, I don't know if that's possible for you to do, but that's when I would say, all right, that's not just cool, I need it. That's a great point, and that, that is absolutely where we are. Uh, Mighty Handles merchandised in both uh, small PDQ displays as well as clip strips and they sit right at the check lane by the gum, five-hour energy and tabloid. So uh, when you are at the store, if you do not see Mighty Handle at the check lane, uh, please say something to the manager because it needs to be at the check lane. Next question in the back of the room again. Did you, did you uh, consider any crowdfunding, Kickstarter, Indiegogo? It seems like it'd be perfect for that. We, we had not looked into it uh, just because uh, between borrowing money from family and friends and cashing out my 401k, we're able to uh, bootstrap everything. I've seen a lot of products do very, very well on that. So, you know, maybe with future endeavors, we'll definitely look at that. Question here up front on your left. Great job, Ben. Thank you. Uh, the color scheme, uh, how did that factor into your due, due diligence? Um, and will you, do you ever plan to change the color scheme? Uh, yes, sir. Originally, the color screen scheme was a very industrial gray and green, and Anita told me it was terrible and nobody's going to buy it. So that played a big part in us changing it. Uh, for future colors, uh, what we're talking about doing, uh, because on a lot of the mommy blogs, uh, women have stated that 
you know, I love it, but I wish I could get it in pink and black, or I wish I could get it in red and white. So I think uh, maybe sometime early next year, we're going to have a fan vote uh, so fans can go on to MightyHandle.com and vote on what the next iteration of our colors will be. Question for you right here. Over here. I'm a, I served in the Navy for 21 years and all over the country, and the Navy Exchange, the Army, the AFI system is a huge organization, so I don't know if you've tried to penetrate that commissary the Navy Exchange. And if they see that, then the military might pick it up as well because soldiers are always overtasked. Soldiers, sailors, airmen, marine, always overtasked with carrying lots of things. And my wife also suggested if your demo dates would be on your website so that people, you know, we could share that information with people to spread the word for that. Cool. Number one, thank you for your service. And two, we have just started looking at selling into the PXs. That's a fantastic idea because you have a very centered customer base who's going to be going there instead of uh, you know, driving 30 or 40 miles off base in order to buy groceries. So that's a great idea. Next question in the middle. Hi, I want you to go international. I travel to Mexico on a regular basis, and they are notorious for using plastic bags at, at Walmart. I will be taking several of them down to my condo at the end of this month. But um, they use plastic like crazy, plus all the public transportation. So Mexico would be a great spot for you. Yep, I think uh, our next goal after hopefully we can do well and, and penetrate markets in the US is Mexico and Canada. Very, very good idea. Okay, question here in the front. <laughs> do you have any of the mighty handles with you today that we can purchase? Uh, <laughs> I brought a limited number of samples to give away for free, uh, so uh, you'll definitely get one. And uh, uh, if uh, I'm not able to give you one, please go to, again, Hyvee Schnooks, or I'm sorry, Hyvee Price Chopper Henhouse or MightyHandle.com to purchase. Question for you right here. Great presentation, and thanks again for being here today. Um, I'm interested in the coating that you have inside of the bag and whether your next products will be things like gym bags and other things where there is bacteria and so forth that could really use that type of technology. That's a great point. Uh, with Georgia, right now, they are uh, limiting our scope to reusable grocery bags. We have already thought about that, though, because when I've left my gym bag in my car in the middle of July. It, Smells like a garbage dump later that day. <laughs> so uh, that is definitely very high on our list uh, once we can hopefully be successful with smart bags uh, to maybe look at future uses. But gym bags will definitely be one of them. All right. Well, I think we're going to have to wrap up. Normally, we'd wrap up with the, uh, the question of what we can do for you. That's obviously up there. Um, if you guys have more questions, I know there are some other hands. Definitely catch them afterwards. This is why you're here. But um, I guess, final words, what is, what is kind of the next steps, what are you excited about, and uh, what can you leave, with, leave us with? Uh, very excited uh, just to show that Kansas City can be a great, almost mecca, uh, for innovation and consumer products. I am not a tech guy, so I knew I could never come up with the next great software or app you know, that would change the world, but I thought if I could provide a product uh, that would provide value to everyday people doing the everyday task of carrying their groceries, there would be some real value there. Uh, so I just want to thank you all again very much for your time, and, and please be mighty. Thank you. All right, all right. So another, another great week. I really appreciate everybody coming. Make sure you tell people to, to come next week, and same time, same place. Thanks, guys.